So um, let me go right into sharing screen here. Close that up. Close this up. All right, so last time we looked at uh, LERPs, uh, 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 an example of importing assets and some of the pitfalls that you can run into. Uh, we talked about cameras, their viewing volume, uh, in the case of perspective cameras, they're a truncated pyramid in an orth orthographic camera, they're a, a, cube, a, a, rect a rectangular solid. Um, we had various clear flags, what, what we see when there's nothing else there. Uh, typically, this is the skybox. Um, we looked at the culling mask that lets us limit what layers we see, and we played with the uh, rect uh, with that positions a camera on the scene. Uh, we had uh, the near and far clipping planes, uh, the field of view, uh, whether what kind of projection it is, and the depth, which is the order that the cameras are rendered. Uh, they go from low numbers to higher numbers. Uh, and we can use this to put a picture in picture in, in our view. Um, uh, we saw our first script with the camera. Uh, we had the smooth look at script. And one thing I want to remind you about is uh, the uh, scripting API that is accessible from anywhere in Unity. This is on your own hard drive when you download Unity. And so if I have a question about one of the, uh, some feature in a script, I can look up the transform. Uh, it then shows me all the different methods that are available with, uh, with that particular component. And in particular, I can find the look at here, where's look at, here's look at. And uh, it shows the different overloads uh, the world up is optional, so we can leave it off. Uh, and, uh, and if we do leave it off, it's the vector up. Uh, and it gives us some example scripts uh, showing different applications of the transform look at. So this is true of any of the uh, 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 any of the scripting API from. Uh, Unity. So uh, the manual's fantastic in, ter in terms of that. And you can cut and paste these examples into your own scripts and uh, immediately have them working. Um, we played with um, um, bouncing balls and the following the camera following our character or following uh, the bouncing ball. Uh, and we also look at another feature of cameras, which is rendering to a texture rather than to the screen. Uh, we then put that texture on a material. <clears throat> we put that material on an object in the scene, and we had our little map view uh, object that the character carried out in front of, uh, in front of it. And uh, uh, this is an alternative to having a, uh, an overlay camera you can also put textures from cameras on objects and scenes. Uh, this was the little script that turned on and off that object. All we were doing was enabling or disabling the mesh renderer, which is the thing that we see in the world and much, much more on scripting later. So I think I had just gotten to, uh, ambi uh, to lights and we looked at ambient lighting. Let me close this up here. Uh, we looked at ambient lighting and <clears throat> um, ambient lighting. Here's a good example of ambient lighting. Um, uh, uh, the ambient light in a scene, we look at the lighting 
main window, which is a pull down from somewhere here, light lighting settings. And uh, the environment lighting or ambient lighting comes from any of a number of different places. It can come from the sky box, it can come from a color, uh, or it can come from one of these gradients where you get to set a sky color and a equator color and a ground color. I'll leave that at sky box. So if I run this, the, the thing that I want you to notice, uh, well, first of all, I have this procedural uh, uh, sky box on here and I have an animated directional light. The animated directional light is controlled by uh, a script that you're welcome to use. It's uh, my SkyDome script version two. Uh, and this does a lot of fancy stuff with the, uh, uh, with the light that is the uh, sun source in our scene. Uh, in particular, it lets you set the latitude, longitude, and date, day of the year, as well as the time and how fast you want the time to be passing. And it does various things with this light. Here, if I watch the values of the color and the intensity as the day progresses, uh, the intensity gets higher, the color turns yellow as it sets. It does some really fancy stuff here. Let me start this over again and this time maximize it. Um, I'm going to turn off the light here. So the light is now off. So now all of the light in the scene is environment light or ambient light that is coming from the sky box. And so the sky is kind of bluish with some, uh, uh, some uh, sunset kind of stuff around the edges. And so my white plane that I'm standing on here has a very bluish tinge. And now I'm gonna change the sky box with the L key. And so now I have some of the sky boxes that many of you have downloaded and used. And you may have seen here that the color of the ground has changed some as I switched into this sky box that has more uh, reddish colors. And here's another uh, uh, sky box that has kind of a lot more blue in it. Here's a, a nighttime sky box and another gray one, uh, another grayish kind of one. And the, the important thing to note here is that our ambient light, which is coming from the sky box, is different for each of these different sky boxes. And it's uh, changing this uh, in real time, which is why here, as this light is changing its position in the sky, uh, there is the intense light of the sun, but there's also a whole bunch of ambient light that is changing in response to that skylight. Um, hush. Um, I, I, I want to show you also here, that's my dog, sorry about that. Um, Liba, hush. She's hooked up here. Just a minute. Oh, there she is. Sorry. <clears throat> so over here, uh, I have a lot of different choices for what I can see in the scene view. And what I'm going to show you is the uh, the real time indirect light. We'll talk a lot more about indirect light when we get to global illumination. But the indirect light is the light that's not coming from directly from a light, but light that is bounced off different objects 
and then hits another object. And so I have this very bright light in, this, in the scene, the sunlight. And this is showing the indirect light, the light that is bounced off those different objects. So if you look here, here's a little red cube and the indirect light uh, around that red cube is kind of, is, is very red. It's on the surface of the ground here. And if we could see it in the, in the, uh, in this view, we'd, we'd see that color bleed into the ground around my different objects. You can see it. Um, you can kind of see it here. See the red uh, that's bouncing off this red object and illuminating the, the ground in front of it. And this is indirect light, which we'll talk about a lot more when we get to global illumination. So that's ambient light. And it's an important component of our world. Uh, uh, it, it comes from the skybox or from a color or a gradient. Uh, and it, uh, it can vary in real time uh, if things are set up properly. Now, the other kinds of lights, uh, uh, the light that's circulating in here is a directional light. And let me go to my other scene here and look at, well, here I have a, the ambient scene. This has no light in it except for uh, the directional light that is the sunlight that is affecting the color of my, uh, that's affecting the color of the skybox. That directional light that is just kind of rotating in the sky uh, has zero intensity. So it's not putting any light into the scene, but because of the way the procedural skybox works, uh, it keys off the direction of that light in terms of how it uh, adjusts the sky. Let me look at a, another directional scene here. So here I've got my uh, Lerps character. Here I've got my Lerps character. And you can see that this directional light, which is somewhere in the scene here, somewhere in the scene here, um, I also have an animator on this, which is going to turn it. It's not a fancy thing like that skybox script. But if, as I let this thing play, that light is changing directions. Uh, as as the animator rotates it, and my a the skybox responds to it, and b all of the shadows and so forth that go with that light are also responding to it. Now the thing about a directional light is it it it's considered to be a light that is at an infinite distance away, so all of its beams are coming in parallel. They're not diverging out the way they will from the spot and uh, point light that we'll look at in a minute. And what this means is that the position of this light doesn't matter. I can move it around in the world. I can put it anywhere I want and the light will be the same because this thing is casting parallel beams of light in a particular direction. And that direction, of course, uh, affects, whoops, not a good one. That, that direction, of course, affects the shadows that I see here. Now, shadows are an important, an important kind of real-time component that lets us uh, that gives a lot of realism to our scene. And the shadows are set on the light. Every light has different shadow types. 
Uh, you can turn off shadows, which you might do if you were working with uh, uh, weak hardware because shadow, shadows cost cycles. Uh, we have hard shadows and we have soft shadows. And each of these have different resolutions. So you can see here with this low resolution, resolution shadow, it's kind of fuzzy. And I, I have different settings for the resolution of this hard shadow. And each one, of course, uh, requires more and more cycles, uh, more and more resources to compute. Soft shadows are kind of blurred. And uh, because they're blurred, they require more cycles. Uh, the way this is done is by casting several pictures uh, from slightly different points and blending them together. Uh, and so soft shadows have the same kind of different resolution uh, as we get the very high resolution soft shadows. They're almost the same as hard shadows. So uh, we have these shadows and we'll see these on every uh, uh, light that we deal with here. Uh, lights also have cookies. Uh, the cookie doesn't make a lot of sense with the directional light, although it does work. Here's a cookie, which is something that we consider to be kind of in front of the light. And so uh, uh, now my light is casting, is casting this sort of flashlight beam, but it doesn't make a lot of sense because this is coming from infinity. So let me put that back to none. None. Um, the, the other thing is, is a flare. And uh, actually, let me show you the flare in this scene. Uh, this this sunlight that's circulating around my world has a flare. Uh, and let me maximize so we can see it. And these flares are not something that we really see in the world. They're artifacts of the optics of the camera. And because we're so accustomed to watching movies that have these artifacts in them, we actually have the ability to put them in unity. So that kind of fuzzy thing that's uh, around the sun is a flare that, uh, that uh, makes it look as though this were being shot through a 50 millimeter camera with a lens that had these internal reflections in it. So that's, that's the, uh, the, the flare. Now, and uh, the directional light, because all the light is moving the same direction, is the least expensive light to do the light calculation for. Point lights radiate light in all directions from a point in space. Uh, and so if we look at a, at a point light scene, a point light, don't save. Here I have a point light. There's my point light set up somewhere in the sky here. And the point light has a range. Light from a point gets dimmer as you're further from the source of the light. And so point lights have a range and I can set this range. It's currently 30 meters. Uh, but if I crank this down, first you see the thing getting smaller over here in the world. And if, as I crank this up, uh, the, that bubble of light gets bigger and bigger. And the point light intensity will decrease from the, the intensity that you set here in the, in the inspector to zero at that range. And of course, 
we can change the color of any light uh, and, and have it cast different colors out into the world. And the point light also has shadows, the same uh, hard and soft and different resolutions. Uh, but if I move this light around, the shadows uh, change because the light is coming from different directions, uh, depending on our position relative to that light. And this is why the point light calculations are more expensive because it has to know the direction of the light in, at every point within our world. Uh, we also have an indirect multiplier, which we'll talk about much, much more uh, with uh, when we start to talk about uh, global illumination. So that's the point light, radiates light in all directions from a point where the light is. Now, the spotlight is kind of like the point light. It radiates light from a point, but it does it, it's limited to a cone. So uh, our spotlight has this cone. Here's the point where the light is radiate, radiating from. But it has this cone uh, that uh, the light is confined to. And we can uh, adjust its range. And the light falls off as we reach the end of this cone. So. Uh, once this is above the ground, no light is reaching the ground from that light. Uh, I can also, of course, set the range over here. Uh, the spot angle uh, is how wide the cone is. And uh, uh, if I set this all the way up to 180, I think it just becomes basically a, uh, a point light that illuminates half the world. Uh, so I can set the, uh, the range of the light and the spot angle. It also has soft shadows, or it also has shadows. Oh, I didn't mention the intensity of the shadows here, which is how dark the shadow is. Uh, if you can see that little shadow of my ball there, as I turn the intensity down, the shadow gets less dark. Uh, a strength of one means the shadow is fully dark. And this applies to the directional and the point light as well. The spotlight is the one where cookies really start to make sense. Uh, when we put a cookie in front of my spotlight, it then imposes that texture on the output of the, of the light here. And so depending what cookie I choose, I get different looking uh, uh, light. And this of course is great for if you're making a headlight or a flashlight or some kind of device that you wanna point around in the world, having one of these cookies on it makes it look very realistic uh, in terms of it being a, a flashlight or some other item like that. So, uh, having a cookie in the scene uh, is uh, pretty cool. Now, I think you remember our little look at script that we, uh, we put on the camera so that it would track our little Lerps character as, uh, as it walked around in the scene. Well, I've put the look at script on the spotlight and its target is the Lerps. And so as Lerps moves around the scene, the spotlight uh, uh, follows uh, it around. So uh, we can, these scripts have many uses and we can use them in lots of different areas. Let me take a break from sharing here and see if there are any questions about the directional point and spotlight and ambient light, any questions? Could we attach a spotlight onto the camera so it could like shine wherever we're looking with the camera? Yes. You you can you could even uh, you could even kind of you know here's my camera 
and it has components. It has a camera component, but I could add a light component to this. Uh, where's the rendering? No. Uh, I could add a light component to the camera like that. Now the camera has a light that it's uh, that it's broadcasting out into the world. Uh, so yeah, you could definitely do that. Make that forty-five, and now this is this red light is pointing out into the world from the from the camera. And of course, it's going to track my character too, because the camera is pointed at my character. So yeah. Or you could do it by childing a light object to the camera. That's another way you could do that. Any other questions? OK, so there's one other kind of light that I want to talk about, and that's the area light. The area light is a, a little more difficult because it's not a real-time light. It's not a light that, uh, that puts light into the world uh, that can change. You saw with my spotlight, it was pointed different directions. It made shadows and everything that moved around as lurks moved. A point light that's moving will cast shadows that change and move. And you saw the directional light. I was able to change its direction and all the shadows responded appropriately. Uh, and even the ambient light, if I changed the skybox uh, by rotating the sun in a procedural skybox, the light changed. Area lights only work if they're baked. So let me go to an area light scene here. No, not that one. Don't save. Here's an area light scene. And let me play this just so that we can see what it looks like. Um, the area light is somewhere up above here, and it's casting shadows. And you notice that the shadows are fairly fuzzy here. Uh, ignore that shadow that's under lerps. That's not a real shadow. And, but notice that the ball is not casting shadows. And that's because when you bake light, you have to decide what objects are going to participate in the baking of the light. And uh, uh, so my cube here, which is this white thing, uh, is set to be light map static, or in the new parlance of Unity 219, it contributes to GI, contributes to global illumination. And these are the only objects that will participate in the baking of the light. So in the, here, the terrain, uh, the terrain, uh, whoops, the terrain, has everything static. Uh, LERPS it isn't. Uh, the sphere isn't. Uh, we'll talk about light probes later, uh, but the cube is. And so these are the things that will participate in the bake. These are the things that will contribute to the global illumination. Now, we look at the lighting window here, and the lighting window is uh, uh, the lighting settings, and you can dock it appropriately. And I also recommend the Light Explorer, uh, which I've got docked down here as well. Now, <clears throat> in order for the area light, which is uh, this little rectangle here, where is the little rectangle? the little rectangle. It's 
sorry, I'm struggling with the fact that it's not showing the outline. of my area light. Well, I'm sorry, I can't see it, but it, it, it is there. Um, the area light, uh, and notice it says baked only, it only works if you bake it, is a rectangle. And it has a range, just like other lights, uh, it decreases uh, with distance. It has an intensity, how bright the light is but it has a width and a height. And oh, there's the rectangle. Uh, and so the width and height is kind of how wide, how big the square is that is our, our uh, rectangular light. And I believe we also have a disc setting. It, it can also be a, 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 a circle instead of a rectangle. Um, the, light is emitted from every point on this rectangle. So the shadows that are produced by uh, area lights tend to be fuzzier because the light is not coming from a point, it's coming from an area. And so it makes fuzzier shadows than uh, uh, we would otherwise have. And the important thing here is it emits light in its forward direction, the blue direction of its, uh, its red, green, blue, X, Y, Z axes. So the, the area, the width and height is in X and Y, and the light is emitted in the Z or forward direction. So again, looking over here to this little pull down, I can look at the baked light map. This is the light that is baked onto the terrain, onto the world that we're seeing here. So this is, this is what's producing all this color uh, in the scene here. This light is baked into the scene. Uh, and we only, of course, have a baked light map if we're uh, uh, if we've baked our scene, and that's done down here. Now you remember uh, I told you to turn off mixed lighting and turn off auto generate because this costs you a lot of cycles, and I want to show you just how many cycles it costs. I've got a little meter over here that's running the CPU load of, of uh, Unity and the Unity Hub. And I'm gonna go ahead and generate lighting here. So this is gonna take a little while and it's going to bake the, the light for this, this scene. Uh, the other thing, let me, let me just show you a feature of this. I'm gonna kind of zoom in on LERPs in the world. And now I'm gonna bake it. Now the light map baker that we're using here, there are a couple of them. There's the old Enlighten that is deprecated. It's still there, it still works. There's the progressive CPU, which is what I'm using here. And there's the progressive GPU, which only works if you're graphics card has certain capabilities and apparently mine doesn't because the GPU baker doesn't work on my computer. So I'm going to generate lighting here and watch down here in this corner where the light light gener uh, where the baking process is uh, uh, described in kind of minor detail. If you happen to be using 2020, this will allow you to open a, uh, a little window that shows you what's going on uh, that's not available in 2019. And the other thing to watch here is the CPU load as, as this thing goes. You'll see uh, uh, the CPU load. So it's preparing the bake, it's baking. The CPU load is, uh, 
gone up to 800 uh, percent. It's uh, the ETA is 21 minutes. That that's an estimate of how much longer it's going to take. Happily, that's uh, 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 not very accurate. It's now down to six minutes. I'm running 1200 percent on the CPU. Uh, uh, I think this has uh, eight uh, eight CPUs with double threaded, uh, and so you can see there was a rather high CPU load uh, for doing this. And this is a MacBook Pro with you know uh, it, it's not a bad processor. It's got a decent graphics card, etc. Uh, so just a warning that baking takes time. And this is a very simple scene. I've got a, a terrain, a character, a ball, and a cube. As you get to bigger and bigger worlds, baking takes longer and longer and longer. So just be aware of this when you uh, uh, start to make fancy scenes and you want to have area lights in. Now, I don't know if you noticed as it baked. Let me bake it again. Uh, this is progressive in the sense that what it will do is it will try and bake this area that I'm looking at in the scene view first. And so let me just bake it again. And I think uh, I'm going to clear the bake data here and generate it again. And you'll see that in the game view, uh, it didn't do it. Never mind. Uh, it it uh, it it puts a higher priority on the stuff that's in the scene view uh, uh, when it's baking, uh, but that didn't manifest in this particular uh, uh, setup. Now, the other, if you have auto generate on, anytime you make a change in your scene it's going to try and bake it. So uh, uh, that's one of the reasons to have auto generate off because this kind of computational load will kick in anytime you do anything in your scene. If I move that cube or if I, uh, if, if I did anything in the scene, that, that would, uh, what happened to my shadows? What happened to my shadows? I lost the shadows. Um, so that's that's the area light. We must have mixed lighting, baked global illumination turned on. There's some other settings that we'll talk about when we get to global illumination. Now, let me show you one other scene here. That was for a three by three light. Here's a 10 by 10 light. Don't say it. Here's a 10 by 10 light. So uh, the, the thing we notice here, and, and this light has the same intensity setting, the same range setting, but because it's 10 by 10, it's now 100 square meters, whereas the 3 by 3 was 9 meters, about uh, close to 10 meters. There's 10 times as much area emitting light, and that's why the light is so much brighter and why the shadow is so much fuzzier, because my light area is now coming from many different places. So uh, 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 the smaller light here has a less fuzzy shadow. It's not as bright. The 10 by 10, whoops, the 10 by 10 light uh, is uh, a much brighter scene because there's much more lighted area uh, to contribute to it. So that's the area lights. So uh, I recommend uh, opening lighting settings and light explorer. I didn't show you the light explorer, but here's the light explorer that shows that there's an area light in here. Uh, this has various properties of the area light. It's, of course, baked. It's white. It has an intensity of five. Uh, shadows are turned on. Lerps has a little light on his jetpack, which is turned off by default. It's a point light. 
Uh, it's mixed mode and a color. Uh, it has a zero intensity because it's turned off and it doesn't do the shadows. And if I if I play this and have Lerps jump, which turns on his light, you'll notice the little uh, that the light turns on and the intensity goes up to one. And so his little point light, which we can't really see the contribution in the scene. Let me go back to a scene where we can see Lerps's light. Maybe in this scene, we can see Lerps of light. So now with the Light Explorer, when Lerps jumps, you can see the light from his jetpack as he jumps around the scene and the light turns on and off. So the Light Explorer is a, is a really good thing to have when you're dealing with different lights. And I'll show you another trick with that in a minute here. So uh, uh, lights, all lights have intensity. They all have color. Uh, they all have cookies, but they only make, cookies only really make sense on the spotlight. They all have shadows with various different settings. Uh, render mode is uh, uh, something we don't need to pay any attention to. We usually use forward mode. Um, the culling mask I didn't mention, uh, but uh, uh, with the cameras we had a uh, we could cull which layers we didn't want the camera to see. Well, with the lights we can uh, cull which layers the light will illuminate. So we could have things in a layer that we didn't want to be illuminated by a particular light. Uh, we also have a halo, which is not a very useful thing. I'll let you play with that if you want to. It's not terribly useful. And we saw the flare, which uh, uh, was the, the camera effect that made it look cinematic. Um, our point and our spotlights have a range. Uh, the light from points and spots diminishes in, with intensity from distance, uh, with distance. Uh, and our spotlight has an angle uh, of the cone that defines it. Now, I don't have a lot of time, but there's one other kind of light uh, that we can have in a scene. And it's not actually a light, it's an emissive material. And we'll talk much more about materials later, but I want to show you this in the context of the light. And emissive materials can either be baked like the area light, or they can be set to real time, which I'll show you examples of and we'll talk about a lot later. But here's an example of a baked emissive material. I have this little cube here uh, that is uh, has on it, uh, where's the cube? The cube red emissive. So it has a glowing material on it, and uh, uh, it has its emission color set to red, so it's giving off light. And because I've baked it, we see this emitted light all around the, the, the cube. And of course, if I go over here and I look at the baked light map, uh, this shows me all of that red light that is coming from this red cube. And I, uh, it, it kind of makes shadows, but uh, they're not uh, uh, real-time shadows like we're accustomed to. So uh, now I've done a little tricky thing here with the red cube emissive. And what I've done is I've hooked an animator to it that's going to take the color of that red cube. You remember when we were talking about the animations, we could move its transform around, but we can also access its renderer and change its materials color. And so here very quickly, I'm going to change the materials color 
uh, of that red cube. It's going to cycle through red and yellow. And notice that the baked color doesn't change. That's because it's baked, not real time. Now, if I go to a scene here where I've got uh, uh, where I've done it with real time. Now my real time now has uh, indirect light. Here's the, the light that's coming from that red cube. I have another uh, emitting material over here, this white object that's making all this white light over here. Now, in this case, my light set, lighting settings are real time. And I've turned off the mixed lighting, the baked lighting. This is real time. And unfortunately, Unity is deprecating this. So this is gonna go away at some point in the future. Uh, I know it's there at least to 2020. Uh, so it hasn't gone away yet, but uh, it may. Now, the Light Explorer also has this little button over here for static emissives. And so uh, I have these different materials that are set to be real time and that have different colors. Uh, the default material uh, is uh, emitting black light. So it's not actually emitting light. And these objects have to be set to be uh, uh, light map static, just like uh, uh, in the baking. They have to have their static setting to contribute to GI, uh, light map static. So now that I have this in real time, and let me leave it unmaximized here. Now as my light, as my emissive material changes color, I'm getting the different colors uh, in my in my landscape here of this changing emissive cube. The white one's not changing, so its light is kind of the same. You'll notice that there's a little bit of lag behind the color change here. It takes some time for the real-time light to populate the world. And so it can take a certain amount of time for that light to populate the world. And here's, here's the indirect lighting over here. Uh, it can't show it while it's computing, but as I pause this, I can see the different indirect light that is populating uh, my world as this light changes color. So uh, these uh, emissive materials can be baked like an area light, and you would do this particularly if they're not changing color or moving. Uh, um, but uh, you can also make them real time, in which case uh, 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 they take some cycles and uh, will update uh, in real time. So I'm going to stop there and get this back to where it was. Got to stop playing and get back to ambient scene. Don't save and stop sharing and entertain any questions. That was a lot, I know, a lot of lights, but lights, the lighting engine in Unity is very sophisticated. It, it has all these different types of lights. It has this real-time uh, ability to change the light in the scene. Uh, it has the ability to bake the light into the scene, which makes the lighting very inexpensive. Baked light doesn't cost anything at runtime. And so your baked lighting can be very fancy and all of the computation goes on uh, in the in the baking process and doesn't go on at runtime, which means your game runs faster. So baked lighting is good, especially if you're working with uh, with lightweight hardware. Uh, 
uh, the real time lighting is much more expensive because it's throwing cycles at the updating of the lighting while you're running. Uh, uh, and and uh, so real time lighting is more expensive. Uh, lights with shadows and so forth, these are updated whether we have the real time or not. Uh, uh, those are all the direct light, the light that comes from a light and directly hits the surface. This is updated in real time uh, always. <clears throat> Mixed is kind of a combination of baked and real time. We'll talk about it when we get the GI, global illumination. Any questions? Fire away. For the uh, homework three, um, yes. Should we use the scene that we had from assignment two, or should we create a new a new scene for that? You can certainly use the scene that you created, uh, the world that you created for assignment two. Yep. Um, I believe most of you turned in a scene with a directional light in it. Uh, often it was the default light that came with uh, a new scene in Unity. Uh, but if you want to, if you want to uh, put point lights, spotlights, area lights, uh, fiddle with the ambient lighting by changing your skybox or whatever. Uh, this is all very good and uh, make something pretty and put characters in it so I can walk around in the world, please. Thank you. Yeah, have fun with it. Thank you. Yeah, good. All right, I'm going to stop recording here.